You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Are you passionate about politics? Do you love movies? Well, you'll find a home here. Let's talk. Welcome to Weekly Wilson. Connie C. Wilson, a small business owner, writer, and educator, covers the gamut from film festival directors to the latest political debates of our time. You can't pigeonhole Connie Wilson, and she likes that just fine. So please welcome the host of Weekly Wilson, Connie C. Wilson. Hi, this is Connie C. C. for Corcoran Wilson here tonight with Weekly Wilson, as we are every Thursday at 7 Central Time. You can probably guess, both from the listing and from our topics over the past several weeks, we'll be talking politics tonight. I wonder why. I wonder what happened just recently. Um, and I, as always, uh, will be uh, in a moment welcoming a guest who will be helping me with that discussion. But I did want to mention before we move on to politics that next week I have a, a special guest coming aboard, a, a director of a uh, film festival favorite called Bleeding Audio. And I, uh, it's a female director who shall uh, remain nameless because I did not write her name down. So I can't tell you right now, but she's going to call in next week and talk about Bleeding Audio, which is a dynamite film, and just watched it during the 43rd uh, Denver Film Festival, and we've set it up that uh, we'll have a little conversation, which will really kind of... uh, talk about the arts in general and what's happened as a result of the pandemic, but it is about a a particular band called The Matches, and they actually have a Wikipedia entry if you want to look up The Matches, and uh, this documentary deals with their uh, attempts to uh, gain fame and fortune, and uh, they have reunited after a a hiatus of a number of years and are a very good band from everything I can tell, and I'm looking forward to that conversation on, I believe it is the 12th. uh, and that's next week. But tonight, I am welcoming back Michael Serapica, the author of Conned Conservatives and Led on Liberals, a Texas author who is calling in from Texas to d- talk about the election, the presidential election just held. Uh, Michael, are you there? Hello. Hi. So hey, what uh, are you? I was having are, trouble getting connected. Yeah, you sound a little, uh, you might have to, if it's too bad, you might have to call in again. You're, you're on my end, it sounds a little, um, there's a fluctuation that is not usually there. But uh, just before I came downstairs to turn on my, my computer and get ready for this, uh, our esteemed president came on television. Uh, my husband, fortunately, pressed the record button for me so I could watch it. And uh, ta- he had, he'd been uncharacteristically silent. And uh, earlier in the day, I did see Joe Biden come out and basically say things that you expect uh, candidates to say about, you know, being calm and waiting, waiting till they count the votes. Um, that seemed normal. It was very short and sweet. And then, interestingly enough, uh, Biden went off to a meeting about the coronavirus. Uh, the man is not yet. Uh, declared to be the winner, and he's already working on the problem that seems to be the biggest problem our country is facing at the moment. Uh, Meanwhile, (laughs) the reports from that front are that our president hasn't been to a meeting of that task force in weeks, and he's tweeting from the White House that the last tweet that I heard and saw, uh, someone tried to defend it to me, it, because it said uh, stop the count, I believe, and uh, I had a, a 
a ardent supporter who uh, told me that that was only because they weren't allowing observers close enough to the count. And I had another one who talked about how awful it was that in Detroit they put some paper up on a glass window into the counting area because from what I have read earlier in the day, armed people showed up in Michigan and were pounding on that very same glass window. So as they're trying to do their, their uh, in some cases, volunteer work of counting, they, they put paper up so they could concentrate and not be threatened from beyond the glass window. So I watched uh, Trump's comments. Uh, did you get a chance to see those, Michael? I saw some of that. Uh, how can you hear me? You hear me okay? Uh, you're coming in gar- a little garble. I mean, I heard you, but uh, it's got that same flutter in it. Uh, you might want to uh, try calling in again as we did the other night when it didn't work quite as well as we'd like. It, it, now, maybe if our engineer says it's okay and going out okay, that's... Oh, he's saying it's garbled, so you should probably make a phone call in, and I'll go on about some of the remarks that... Uh, that President Trump made on uh, television just very shortly. It was during Lester Holt's evening broadcast, which uh, for us here starts at 5.30 p.m. And uh, I was I was not yet uh, ready to start, and I was gathering up some notes. Uh, but one of the things that he said, which they, he had so many, um, sh- I won't call them lies, I will call them distortions, uh, that that the talking heads, one of whom was Chuck Todd, finally had to correct some of them because he said that the all the counting boards were run by Democrats. That was one uh, misstatement. He may not have known who was actually doing the counting, but it, it was not all Democrats. Uh, that was untrue or simply, uh, you know, perhaps he was mistaken. Uh, he talked about lots of litigation. I wrote that phrase down. Um Lots of litigation is certainly what we're seeing. I I have been told or read or maybe I saw it on television that two of these suits uh, that have been lodged already, and those being, I believe it was Michigan and Wisconsin, have already been uh, dismissed, that some of the suits are not moving forward because uh, they don't have really any grounds to have the suit. And uh, there was a lot of talk about fraud. Here's the line I wrote down about ballots this is they wait and wait and then they find them well these were mailed in ballots uh like my own in illinois uh which was mailed in a long time ago and of course they waited and waited in some states they can't even start counting until the election day uh, or maybe when the day is over so it depends on your state And I don't think they just waited and waited and found them. I think these have all been there and they've been, uh, you know, starting to count them. And some states have and and some have not. Here is what uh, Biden said in his afternoon address. He said, quote, the process is working. We have to count the votes. Now, that seemed pretty, uh, well, it seemed pretty presidential, for one thing. It was not an attempt to stir things up or cause trouble or uh, get things uh, all a a flutter twit. Um, Chuck Todd made the comment, quote, he's trying to set a narrative. And the narrative uh, certainly is very clear. And I'm going to revisit that narrative as laid out, in fact, in an editorial that I reprinted on my uh, weekly Wilson blog that talked about ways in which they might cheat. So we will do that after a short break and we'll be joined by Michael Sarapika. Dr. R.C. will share extraordinary resources and services that promote educational success as well as making a difference in the lives of all social workers as well as the lives of children, adolescents, and teens of today. She will have open discussions addressing many of the issues that we face about our youth and how being employed in the uniquely skilled profession of social work for over 18 years has taught invaluable lessons through her personal experiences. She will also provide real-life facts, examples, 
skills and personal stories that will confirm that why serving as a child advocate is extremely beneficial when addressing the needs of the whole child. Listen live Saturdays, 10 a.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio as Dr. RC will provide thought-provoking information that will empower, encourage, and strengthen students, families, and communities across our nation. You can also visit her at soarwithkatie.com. Have you ever felt like no one is listening or you're not getting the honest attention you deserve? Do you even know the kind of attention you want or need? You are not alone. Alice Aspen March is here to help. Thanks to Alice, through her epiphany and research over the word attention, there are solutions to the attention dilemma. Worldwide audiences have been enthralled and engaged for over 40 years with her visionary and pioneering observations. The kind of attention we get and give is vital to improving our lives and society. Alice and her weekly guests review game-changing insights for transforming and improving our understanding of attention, providing techniques for creating healthier and empowering behavior. Get a new perspective on a mainstream word. Tune into Why Our Attention Matters for fresh and thought-provoking conversations every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on BoldBraveMedia.com and the TuneIn Radio app. This is Connie Wilson back with you on Weekly Wilson, and joining us is Michael Serapica. Uh, Michael, continue with the comment you were making to me uh, before when, while we were off. Uh, yeah. Um, I was just watching uh, CBS News just before I called in, and they were laughing about Something Trump said a little while ago, I think he had a press conference about an hour ago, and he was complaining that they need to stop counting, at, like he has been, in the states where he's falling behind, but they need to continue counting in the states where he has the lead. Yeah, and yeah, very selective, I wasn't it? As funny as they did. It is funny because uh, it's a it's a close race, and no one uh, no one is disputing the fact that this is a very close race. When you're looking at uh, percentages that are forty nine point eight percent, and this is in Trump's favor, forty nine point eight percent versus forty eight point nine percent, which are almost uh, you know with just very very close ninety three percent of the votes in in the state in question. Pennsylvania. Remember last week I I said, look up the stuff on Pennsylvania. They say the Keystone State is the key to everything. And here we are waiting at this uh, advanced hour for Pennsylvania to weigh in. And uh, the the actual vote when I came downstairs was, let's see if I can do this properly, that Trump was ahead. So lest anyone think I am uh, not giving him his due, he had 3,263,000 995 votes, and he was ahead. Uh, Biden had 3,199,729 votes, which, if you do the math, I believe it's about 64,266 votes separating these two gentlemen, with 93% of the votes uh, counted, and this is in the state of Pennsylvania, the Keystone State, the big one they kept talking about. It's similarly tight everywhere else. In fact, the big, big, uh, you know, leads that Trump came out and, and crowed about the night of the election, that was predicted by everyone, including me. Uh, we knew that those who asked for mail-in ballots were generally, generally, not always, but generally people who were Democrats. Um, the Democrat people like me are much more concerned about the coronavirus and exposure to it and did not want to go out to a poll. And I didn't want to stand in long lines either. It's cold here now. And I didn't want to be uh, hassled by the poll watchers, which in Trump's case, you spell it capital P-O-L-E, poll, <laughs> poll watchers. There's a lot of humor <laughs> Out of that one uh, on on the television as I've been watching, so we've got several uh, very close states. But I believe the um, summation I've seen is that there's really only one way for Trump to uh, win. He has one path. It's pretty much a clean sweep path, 
whereas Biden has more than one, and I've had heard it at, as high as six at one point. I think that may have dwindled. Uh, but he's chipping away at the Republican lead. The Republicans mostly, not all, mostly voted by going, you know, out in the old fashioned way, go and stand in line and pull the lever or whatever. Uh, that was what they were encouraging them to do. Uh, to me, that seemed not only silly, but somewhat dangerous. Uh, as we talked about last week, I've actually been down with the uh, infamous coronavirus, and I certainly did not need to go out and expose other voters to that. I think we're through the worst of it now, having been diagnosed on the 18th of October. I'm, this is now uh, quite a bit past that, and we're on the mend and feeling better and not, but we don't want to go out. I mean, who, who wants to go stand in a line for four hours in the Midwestern cold uh, and possibly expose themselves to germs that even if they're not fatal, which in our case, thank God, they are not, uh, it's not fun. You know, no one likes to be sick. And that's why most of the Democrats who I recently read in a, a Pew poll are the more highly educated uh, of the two parties now. That, that has flipped a bit from old years of yore. So what did you think of uh, of the you know, kind of surprise of how close this race was. Were you expecting it? Um, actually, no. It, it it kind of took me by surprise. I thought that uh, a lot more people would have voted uh, <coughs> like, like I did. And by that, I mean uh, not for Trump. I didn't vote for Biden either. But something curious, actually, uh, since I mentioned that, uh, Nate Silver, who writes for, I forget, he's a journalist. He writes for an independent news uh, organization now. He uh, wrote a column and he uh, mentioned that in 2016, 12% of voters were either undecided or voted third party. 12%. This year, that was only 4.8 percent. So a lot more that a lot more people voted, and we see that. that I think this was the uh, highest turnout in history. They had uh, like two thirds of eligible voters vote. I think this year. I remember when I was a union representative, we had a meeting with the AFL CIO talking about elections, and one of the AFL-CIO uh, agents mentioned that a 10% turnout in an election, any election, is considered good. So a 75% turnout is astounding, really. Uh, and and no, I think that's... It, it, I think that yeah, that no, I, uh, I, I, it was exacerbated by um, by this <clears throat> the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic and there has been no federal response uh, that people a lot of people it may not have been listed as the single biggest issue when they did pre polling or post polling because surprisingly I saw one that said it was the economy and I thought the economy is certainly. Uh, it's certainly high on our list of things we need to fix, but it went down the tubes because of the pandemic. And, you know, these these two things are joined uh, as as night and day. Uh, our economy wouldn't be in the dumper right now, probably, uh, if we hadn't been struck by a pandemic with and, and completely and totally unprepared to deal with it. Terrific article in Vanity Fair called They Went to Jared about how Jared of the Kushner uh, son-in-law did literally nothing. And it's uh, I may try to boil it down and make it into a shorter version for my blog, but it was just depressing to read it because, you know, obviously they knew about this. And, and as I was telling Michael, because I have been reviewing films for two different film fest festivals right now, even though ill, one in Chicago, one in Denver, there's one and it's showing on YouTube and it's about Wuhan and how it broke out and three brave Chinese filmmakers 
made a, a film, which somewhere you can find and watch on YouTube in its entirety. It's called 76 Days, and it is riveting, and it's all about the coronavirus hitting Wuhan, a city of 11 million. And 76 Days is what they were shut down. So that's why it's called 76 Days. So when we come back after this break, we will go on and talk a little bit about the election, since that's our topic tonight. So don't go away and come back and join us if you have any thoughts of your own. Tune into It's All About You with host Dr. Martha Latz, a lively weekly broadcast on BBM Global Network, one of the most empowering shows for time-starved, overscheduled multitaskers. The professional expertise of Dr. Latz is directly available live every Thursday at 1 p.m. to answer and address concerns about relationships, life transitions of career, meeting, dating, and committed relationships. It's All About You with Dr. Latz will expand your understanding of career current concerns across your relationships by broadening and expanding possible solutions in developing skills for mutually desired outcomes. Dr. Martha's expertise is as a licensed marriage and family therapist, life, transition coach, and all things to do with communication at work, home, and with friends. Check out her website at auniquetherapycenter.com. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network, and to Tune in radio. This is Connie Wilson on Weekly Wilson here with Michael Sarapika talking, of course, about the election. And uh, we before I got a little off topic and talked about a wonderful documentary about the coronavirus made in China. But that uh, that is inextricably linked to uh, what we're seeing. Uh, we've already said that we didn't really get very good polling uh, pre- uh, prophecies of who would win what. And uh, our president, uh, Mr. Trump, did reference that. He called it a uh, strategy that they were trying to do this on purpose. I just don't think that they ask the right people or people don't tell the truth when they're asked, which could very well be. But I got began wondering, now, first of all, uh, Michael, tell us what the two totals are that the candidates are currently given. Oh, you mean uh, electoral votes, the, the, the disparity? Yes. Yeah, I noticed that um, <coughs> on the, the, the liberal uh, media outlets, well, let's, let, let's call it what it is, the neoliberal media outlets like CNN and the other corporate stations, uh, they're polling or reporting, rather, Biden, uh, since day before yesterday and right up until just before we went on the air, Biden at 253 and Trump at 213. On Fox News, they're reporting Biden at 264, which would mean he only needs six more electoral votes to win, and Trump at 214, just about where the other outlets are reporting him. And the Fox News uh, numbers coincide with Associated Press. So I take that to (coughs) see that Fox is actually reporting the numbers more accurately. I don't know what uh, would cause CNN, MSNBC, uh, CBS even, to report it incorrectly other than maybe they're trying to build drama and create their own narrative 
which we know uh, they're not want to uh, avoid doing ever. You know, the, 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 if they can, they will. But uh, according to them, because I and this is watching it uh, not just tonight and today, but but the day of the election, they mentioned several times that w- the last thing they wished wanted to do was call any state prematurely, and they were going to go to great lengths not to call any state prematurely. And I think probably our listeners have heard that there was a bit of a kerfuffle, and that uh, Donald Trump was not very happy with with Fox, his home station, because they had prematurely, he felt, called Arizona for uh, for his opponent. And he did not like that one little bit. I began to wonder what would happen if nobody ever got to 270. And I looked up, and this is just, you know, you can look it up yourselves on Wikipedia and get a better, more in-depth uh, look at it or pick up book up. But I didn't know whether that had ever happened right off the top of my head. Not in my lifetime, anyway. And I looked read up a little bit on the 12th amendment which uh it's apparently this is that has happened but only three times in history in 1801 1825 and 1837 now the first one was uh thomas jefferson versus aaron burr and that was uh quite a barn burner i think we might remember those names uh, ourselves because that they were certainly engraved in history as uh people that had a lot of conflict. And 1824 was Andrew Jackson, who lost to John Quincy Adams, but it, he thought he had it in the bag, and, and he kind of didn't didn't get voted in anyway. 1836, they had faithless electors, uh, and the electors refused to vote for Martin Van Buren's vice president. Now, I did not know this part. Apparently, if there is this bit where you don't get to 70, the U.S. House decides the presidency. But if you have a dispute over the vice presidency, which was the case in 1836, Apparently, they didn't like Richard Mentor Johnson, who had whom uh, Van Buren had selected. So that goes to the Senate. And so it's a little bit different. And the, the idea of being to get to 270 out of the 538 uh, electoral votes. And it, if if they still don't could get up somebody by the the date of January 20th, and they haven't solved this in, in uh, Congress and in the Senate or the House, then the vice president becomes the acting president till the House selects somebody. And then you go into Section 3, where Congress can appoint an acting president. And then you go into, uh, you know, the speaker goes in temporarily. And that has never occurred. But that's the Presidential Succession Act of 1947. So in case you wonder whether anybody never, ever got to 270, well, three times. And I don't know whether we can honestly say the third time that was the vice presidency of Martin Van Buren that caused all the issues. But I learned something there. I guess I had never been interested enough to look it up before. And when I looked it up, that's what I learned. Uh, so we are now. Well, I'll as tell you, you s- what, I, I would not be one bit surprised if this election goes all the way to January 20th. And with the shenanigans that Trump is trying to pull, uh, I mean, I, I could see uh, who, who the heck knows, the mayor of Washington, D.C., filling in for, for a week. Who, who, who knows? Yeah, I would not be surprised to see it drag on also. And I, every time I uh, acknowledge that fact to myself and others, I I think with great sadness of all the people out of work that are just waiting for this to be over so that we can, you know, enact some sort of help for them. I'm talking about the people in the long lines to get food and their businesses have shut down. And, you know, we all know that there was one check, which seems like it was a, Five years ago at this point. I mean, it was so long ago that that money was long gone and certainly not a, a very much to begin with. I know it was far less than other countries gave to their voting citizens. I, they, in Canada, they were far more generous. And it's just, uh, you know, everything's on hold. And I agree with you. There's all kinds of holdups that are going to ha- happen. And here's what I had printed on my blog prior Uh, to all of this happening. It says, Trump is telegraphing his scheme 
uh, at the debate. He said he, quote, can't go along with the result tallied up from millions of mail-in ballots, which will mean, quote, fraud like you've never seen, end quote. He urged supporters to, quote, watch the voting very carefully, which ended up being voter intimidation. He also said he might not need, quote, need is in quotes, the court to settle the election itself. But uh, as as far fetched as it seems that uh, state legislature might appoint pro-Trump electors, uh, it's important that Republicans, some of them are already claiming that this fictional mass fraud in the large scale mail balloting, uh, would be a justification for sending in their own electors that would represent them because the there's just too much fraud, even though most Republicans, uh, and I'm talking about the, the talking heads, have not gone along with uh, the president's uh, pronouncements from the microphone stand. They have said that this is just, there's just no evidence of it, and it's just him uh, setting up a scenario. So that's the Hail Mary pass they're talking about. We'll talk about uh, what we think might happen next after we come back from break. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the B. BBM Global Network. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. Yeah, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416 529 7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. This is Connie Wilson here on Weekly Wilson on the Bold Brave Media Global Network with my guest, Michael Serapika, talking politics as we have done for oh quite a few weeks now. And I had just uh, thrown out this topic. I remember vividly the, uh, the euphoria I felt when it appeared that the United States had voted in uh, Barack Obama, because I felt it showed that we were rising from the old style KKK ashes and we had become a, a much more egalitarian, more uh, more the ideal that we want our nation to be, where you you all have rights and you're treated equally. And here we have elected our first uh, first president to show that we not only say that in our Constitution uh, and everywhere else, the statute of liberty, you name it, but we actually put our votes behind it and voted this man into office as our top executive. And I was so excited. I happened to have been going back and forth from my condo in downtown Chicago to Grant Park. I was uh, that was the night that uh, our pre- then president Obama was uh, getting ready to come out and speak to the assembled masses in the park. It happens to be right across the street from me. So I ran back and forth. I was uh, 
uh, on assignment. I was blogging live all night, and it, it worked out beautifully for me. But I just was so uh, elated that we had had shown ourselves to be a uh, you know our better angels. We weren't racist, horrible KKK people. We actually had voted for Barack Obama, even though his middle name was Hussein, and we had not let that derail us with with horrible thoughts. We were good people, and we were going to give everybody a fair shake. Then we had the uh, subsequent election of Donald Trump, and uh, I heard a I think it was CNN, whoever it was, it was an African-American talking head, and he was being very intelligent about it and not at all fired up. He said he just felt that the the people like me in the United States who thought that, who were all excited that we had shown how egalitarian we were and how we were fair-minded people, just didn't know how much racism they have been dealing with for literally decades. And I'm wondering if this divisive, you know, the Black Lives Matter people are certainly making it clear that they want to have equal treatment. Uh, How did you feel uh, about all of the Trump dog whistles, you know, to various followers of his? Well, it it, it had uh, me quite distressed and disturbed. So I had to go back to my book and look for a basis, a reason for why this works. And it turns out that I did discover it when I wrote my book, and I had to uh, pull it out of the archives. What, what's happening with these people is what's known by psychologists as confirmation bias. It's, uh, you know, I'm okay, and you are okay if you agree with me. But if you don't agree with me, then you're to be discarded they 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 confirm that because of uh the necessity to you can't uh you can't look in the mirror with um, uh any confidence if you don't feel how did mark twain put it no man can be content without his own approval that's the way to interpret confirmation bias they feel that they're better because of what they believe. They feel that they're never wrong. And the most important part of that is that they feel that they're entitled to act badly because they're acting badly for the greater good. So their bad actions are not bad. Their bad actions are good. Others' bad actions, like protesters who are in the street because of injustice, they're bad. But us being in the street protesting that Donald Trump is being cheated because we feel he's being cheated when he's really not, we're not being bad doing that. We're being good. Don't you think that there has uh, I became aware of this uh, here during the election lead up when one of the local candidates brought in a speaker who was as as it turns out he was just an out and out uh, white nationalist and he had secured a local church and a pulpit from which this person was being invited to guest speak and it was there were two candidates running for office but this guy from you know out of town came in and gave one of the more racist rants I've ever heard and someone in the audience had taped it with their phone and it made the rounds here in the local community. Holy mackerel, did you hear what he said? Some people got up and left. Uh, This was a a nice little church in in Iowa, but this guy was way, way over the pale. And when I saw the tape, which was, I believe, on YouTube, I wrote just a little comment. It was like two lines. It wasn't very long. And and all I said was, gee, you know, we've come... fallen so much from the words on the uh, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, I lift my lamp beside the golden door, which is the Statue of Liberty inscription at the bottom um, uh, Emma Lazarus and I that's what I wrote, I said how could we have, you know, how could someone say this when our Statue of Liberty has always welcomed uh, you know, immigrants and we've always been fair to immigrants, at least this was my naive thought at the time before Donald Trump rose to power and I didn't 
didn't go. I don't go to YouTube faithfully, and and I hardly ever comment. May have been my only comment ever. But I got a, some kind of notification in my mailbox, and it said, you have a, a comment. And I went out there. There were about 20. I won't repeat any of them because we, we probably would be kicked off the air. But these uh, white nationalists had just, you know, completely demeaned me and said I was terrible and horrible. And all I had printed were, were the words on the basis of the Statue of Liberty. And it was all about how awful it was that we ha- were becoming a nation of immigrants, that we only white people should live here. And it just I didn't realize there were that many people out there, or nor did I think anyone would ever comment on my very um, – it's certainly not certainly not my words. They they are very wonderful words, but they're not mine. And they've been around on the Statue of Liberty for hundreds of years. But there are a lot. I mean, mega mega people, and the mega people are primarily uh, building on this. I'm sorry to say, I, I, it's just it just blew me away because the language they used was far less eloquent than Emma Lazarus. Let, may I leave it at that? And uh, I thought, that, that is- wow. I That's just couldn't totally believe it. totally disgusting and horrible. That's confirmation bias. Yes, it was. And uh, when we come back, I want to ask you the question, what about Trump in 2024 if he does, in fact, not prevail this time, which it doesn't appear he will at the moment. I'm not counting any chickens. And I want to tell you of my two dreams I had before, uh, before we get off the air, but that'll be after this short break. Global Glory, that's the work of Dr. Marina McLean, COO of Global Glory, whose calling is to serve God. A first-generation British-born Londoner of Jamaican descent, Dr. McLean inherited the hunger for the word from her father, who was a Bible teacher. Growing up, her home was filled with missionaries from the Caribbean islands and America, and she travels the world preaching the gospel. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology and an honorary doctorate of divinity and Christian counseling from France. International Christian University. Dr. McLean is also a songwriter and recording artist, and her songs are written during summits and conferences in the presence of God. She's recorded three worship albums to date and is in ministry for 28 years alongside her husband, Dr. Rennie McLean, who shares her passion. Visit www.globalglory.org or on Facebook at Global Glory. Call 866 244 5679 and feel the glory. French Rastafarian baker Chef Hugues Mott is a fourth-generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations and classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Chef Uvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Uvmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefugues.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. This is Connie Wilson on Weekly Wilson. Don't forget to check any of our podcasts on weeklywilson.com. They'll be up there, a little button you can push. And I'm here tonight with Michael Serapica, the author of Conned Conservatives and Led on Liberals. And I had just asked him before break, uh, and this is an assumption that I am, I, I am not going to uh, – say it I feel is fact but we're watching our local channels and there seems to be a better path to the presidency for Biden than for Trump so I'm saying let's assume for the moment that that becomes the truth and that Trump is out and Biden is in do we think that Trump will come back in 2024 what would you what would you say to that Michael uh, my <coughs> best guess is that he's never going to go away. Uh, he's, he, he'll, he'll be uh, moving out of the White House, and he might very well position himself to run again in 2024 because he puts, like the uh, baseball and football team owners like to say, 
He puts the asses in the seats. People want to watch him. People are fascinated by him. He's like an airplane crash on steroids. So what I think is going to happen on January 21st might even happen on January 20th. He might just decide to skip Biden's inauguration. You're going to probably see him with his own (coughs) TV show, most likely on Fox. And he's going, he's going to be covered, and they're going to be showing clips and quotes of his TV show on Fox, on CNN and MSNBC and all the other networks, because they're going to want a piece of the action, too. They're not going to want to lose this golden goose that's been bum- bumping their ratings for the last four years. Now, and what do you think about his after son? All is said and done in 2024. You might be right. He might run again. Other than that, as far as his crimes, I think that's all just going to be swept under the rug. I don't think he's going to suffer for anything he's done because the crimes that he's committed just by breaking constitutional law as president could have gotten him in his first month in office, could have gotten him impeached, and it would have stuck. But the Democrats refused because they're probably guilty of the same type of crimes. So they dreamed up that (laughs) Russiagate baloney and just wasted everybody's time. So I think Trump is going to do just fine whether he wins this election in the next two or three days or doesn't win. So you don't see him fleeing to Russia to avoid the Southern District of New York and prosecution. You don't think he'll be prosecuted for tax fraud or uh, the uh, or the people that to whom he owes millions uh, will uh, plunge him into some one of his many bankruptcies. I can uh, I hear you on the uh, give him a TV show and let him be the golden goose again. Uh, I think he's grooming Don Jr. for uh, and probably Ivanka as well, since she's the favorite child. You certainly can't leave her out of the mix when he thinks that the sun rises and sets on Ivanka. And quite frankly, compared to uh, the uh, other (laughs) offspring, I'd have to agree with him on that. But none of them are qualified for the jobs they currently hold. That much we know. In fact, uh, the son-in-law can't even get appropriate security clearance. And and so the president just decreed they must give him one, even when he didn't pass the rather high bar for uh, for security uh, clearances. And I'm exactly. hoping. Look, look, look at what they're getting. Uh, look at what they're getting away with uh, uh, w- without impunity. That that's a perfect <laughs> example. Look at uh, the attorney general Barr and this other crook that owns a company that delivers mail privately, who he made the postmaster general so he can destroy the post office. They brought these guys before Congress, and Congress asks them questions, and they have the gall to just tell Congress, I don't want to answer that question because I don't think it's any of your business. In In those very words, I saw Barr say that in those very words right to the Congress persons that were asking him questions. These guys should have, uh, the, the, the congressmen and the senators, whoever was, I think uh, Kamala Harris was uh, interrogating Barr when he said that. She should have waved her hand and said, Sergeant at Arms, clap the handcuffs on this guy and throw him in jail for contempt of Congress. They didn't do anything. That's why I have no faith that Trump is going to be held accountable for anything he did either. And not, and that isn't even addressing the emoluments clause of the Constitution about not profiting while in office, which we both know, and anyone out there in listener land knows that uh, between the uh, fees he has charged for, you know, his golf cart usage, and for uh, for a while he was charging exorbitant sums. This is back the beginning of his uh, time in office when Melania uh, had not yet joined him, and 
and the supposedly because their child was in school, there are many variations on that story. But anyway, he had charged the Secret Service some incredible amount. It got so high, they finally got like a trailer and put it on the curb because it was just outrageous what he has, uh, how he has soaked the Treasury for things like using golf carts when they're covering him on his golf outings, which seem to never end. And, you know, I, I was struck by the difference between how the two men are waiting out this uh, obviously somewhat turbulent time. It's anxiety producing. I'll tell you how it affected me in a moment. But, you know, we had our presumptive uh, hopeful president in Biden went to meetings today about the coronavirus and how to deal with it. And meanwhile, Trump was tweeting, stop the count. And finally, his people said, uh, don't say stop the count because you really need him to keep say stop the fraud. And so he changed his uh, tweeting uh, slightly after being advised that what he was saying made no sense for the reasons we discussed earlier. Here's the, here's the dream I had. I want to share this with you. I, I know it's all my anxiety coming out. I never once believed that this was going to be a blue wave. I am. Uh, I have a brand new car, and in my dream, I am for some reason I am laying on the front seat of my car. I don't know why, and I'm. I'm mobilized. I cannot move. There are lights that I can see coming at me. I'm going about 60 miles an hour. I know I have to sit up and grab the steering wheel and steer, but I can't. I'm just frozen. I'm immobilized. And at any moment, this this car is going to smash into me. So that's how I spent the night before the election. Uh, we will come back after this break and think about happier thoughts. MJ Domit is the owner of Expect to be Empowered, a company whose specialty is empowering people to live their best life by following their heart and accepting themselves unconditionally. After studying and making personal changes, MJ now focuses on giving others tools for self-empowerment. She provides individual and group workshops for people who are physically, emotionally, and spiritually blocked. Inspired by her work at Expect to be Empowered, MJ authored the book Waves of Blue Light, Heal the Heart and Free the Soul with accompanying empowerment cards she is a spirit book of the year gold medal living now book award winner and her book is a number one amazon bestseller in spirituality and was a 2012 gold medal winner recognized as the living now spirit book of the year an inspirational speaker mj will show you how you can repurpose every area of your life your life did not just happen to you you chose it which means you can change it visit www.expecttobeempowered.com or call 866-264-8024 if you seek a courageous advocate, prepare to champion your rights with consumer service agencies that support aging populations. Carol Ann Hamilton is the one for you. Carol Ann is an elder care coach, author, and speaker with a quarter million hours lived experience successfully supporting unculpable aging parents. As a result of a challenging journey, Carol Ann revolutionizes how stressed out caregivers restore serenity to their worlds. She also brings over 25 years of change management expertise in Fortune 500 settings to catalyze urgent transformation within the elder care industry. Carol Ann is a popular speaker at conferences across North America. She has appeared via TV, radio, and print globally. Now you can tune in weekly to get a dose of her inspiration plus down-to-earth advice to cope with even the most difficult aging parents. Listen Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on Bold Brave Media and TuneIn Radio. This is Connie Wilson here with Weekly Wilson uh, on the Bold Brave Media Global Network and talking with Michael Sarah Pika. And before the break, I suggested to him that we should try to end with something cheerful. As I had related my, uh, it was really an intense dream. I kind of staggered out with this thought, uh, just feeling anxiety. And I'm sure I was not alone in that. And Michael said he might have a, a positive, less stressful thought. What would that be, Michael? Uh, yeah, curiously enough, some good did come out of this election. Uh, Biden's probably going to win. Uh, the good part of that is we won't have to see Trump in the White House anymore. And we did lose a lot of uh, elections that we thought we'd like to see. Uh, some Congress people uh, there was a lot of bad news. Mitch McConnell won again. I have no idea how he pulled it off, Lindsey Graham. But there was some good news. In 
South Dakota, New Jersey, Arizona, Montana, and Oregon, 60% of the voters, which is a landslide, voted to legalize marijuana. Aha. Uh-huh. And in Oregon, they voted to legalize all drugs, heroin, opium, you name it. And that was a very big deal in the country of Portugal that reduced crime dramatically. It a it, it'll aid tax revenue. Um those taxes can be used and will be used to fund drug treatment programs, and it'll get a lot of innocent people who are in prison just for smoking a joint out back on on the street and into the uh, public uh, uh, workforce, hopefully where they belong again, and it'll, it'll create less opportunity for people to be harassed by the goddamn cops. So I think so, that was a very good thing. That gave me a lot of uh, encouragement. I'm quite frankly, uh, as a child of the 60s, I had thought that they would legalize marijuana about 40 years ago. I cannot even believe, and I went to Berkeley, so believe me, there there was plenty of it available and around. I just never assumed it would take uh, however many years. That's been 50 years or whatever. It's been a long time coming, but there has been uh, there has been some progress on that front. And, and even though it's a terrible silver lining, because I hate to say anything positive about this plague that is now decimating our country, and we're getting, I don't know, 100,000 infections a day uh, in Iowa, the head of the Iowa Iowa, uh, University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics says that it could get that as bad as what it was in Italy at the beginning where the doctor has to, uh, you know, basically decide who gets help and who doesn't because they have a 15% infection rate and the deaths are climbing. But it may be the factor that rid us, at least not for now, from Donald Trump. So I'm I'm hoping and I'm watching my TV just like all of you and I'm urging all of you that are listening tonight to please come back when we will have a, a little happier topic next week when the Bleeding Audio uh, director will join me and talk about the documentary about a, den- a band called The Matches. Look it up on Wikipedia. And they were really good and uh, they're good again. So I'm going to be talking with her about that award-winning documentary next week and then we'll see how this uh how this election season goes if it keeps rolling along michael may rejoin us and we'll talk some more so don't uh, leave us in the lurch just remember we'll be here thursday seven o'clock central time this has been weekly wilson with your host connie c wilson Join her each week with a lively discussion of political matters, movies, books, and other topics that capture the heart and mind, right here on Weekly Wilson. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company. 